Welcome to the Beyond the Basics Bible Study Podcast. My name is Dan Snyder, and I am your host. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond the Basics, where we are exploring the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, one chapter at a time. So this week, we're going to get into Genesis chapter 29. And I'm sure that we've all experienced the consequences of poor decisions that we've made or the consequences of sinful actions that we've made. And if you can think of maybe a time when you've experienced those consequences through the actions of somebody else. So, for example, maybe you manipulated somebody and in return that person was manipulative to you. Or maybe you lied to somebody and in return that person lied to you. That's what we're going to be dealing with here in Genesis chapter 29. So let's get into the chapter. In verse 1, it tells us that Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east, and he saw a well in the field, and there were three flocks of sheep lying beside it. That's where these flocks were watered, and there's a large stone on the well's mouth. It says when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep. Either this Stone was so large, it required all the shepherds to roll it away, or they waited for all the shepherds to arrive so that they could water all their flocks all at the same time, so they only had to roll it away once. Then, after they watered the sheep, they would put the stone back in its place over the mouth of the well. In verse 4, Jacob said to them, My brothers, where do you come from? And they said, We are from Haran. Jacob asked them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. Then in verse 6, Jacob asks, is it well with him? And they said, it is well. And see, Rachel, his daughter, is coming with the sheep. And in verse 7, Jacob said, behold, it is still high day. It is not time for the livestock to be gathered together. So the flocks in those days were, were watered in the morning or the evening. That's when they would come to the well and drink. But this was the middle of the day. That's what Jacob means by saying it's not time for them to be gathered together. So Jacob says, why don't you just water the sheep and go and get them to the pasture? It's, what he's saying is they should have been watered many hours ago. This should have been done already. You need to water them and get them back out into the pasture. Jacob knew what he was doing. He was a, he was a good shepherd. He was a skilled shepherd. And so he's telling these shepherds that, that they need to get these sheep back out in the pasture. And so they reply, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together. So not all the shepherds had arrived yet. And again, they couldn't roll the stone away from the well without all of them there, either because the stone was too big or because they only wanted to roll the stone away once with everybody present. So they say, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and the stone is rolled from the mouth of the well, and then we water the sheep. In verse 9, it says, while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. So Rachel was the shepherd that they were waiting for. That's why they couldn't roll away the stone yet. They were waiting for Rachel to arrive. She probably couldn't roll the stone away all by herself. Again, this is probably a very big stone. So they waited for her to make sure that her flocks were watered. But she was so late that it was the middle of the day. She was supposed to be there with the other shepherds in the morning. This implies that these shepherds had been waiting around all day, all morning, for Rachel to show up. So the day that Jacob arrives, he finds out that Laban has shepherds and flocks. And these shepherds, they do not run a very efficient system. They are waiting around, wasting time, waiting for each other, not showing up on time. It's a big problem. But the other thing that we notice here is Jacob is at this well. And now Rachel, Laban's daughter, is approaching the well. So Jacob is meeting Rachel at a well, just like Abraham's servant met Rebecca, Jacob's mother, at a well. So it says... Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth, which may have been something that required multiple shepherds. They were all waiting 
to do this. It could have been that it was a stone that was easily moved by just one one person and they had just been waiting for everyone to show up. But the story seems to imply that multiple shepherds were needed to roll this stone away and Jacob did it all by himself. Is he showing off? I don't know. Probably. Maybe. Guys, if you're listening, would you show off like this? Maybe. Probably. So he rolled the stone away and he watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. So Jacob watered Rachel's flock of sheep, just like Rebecca watered the servants' camels. All these sheep are sitting around. These are multiple flocks that were managed by multiple shepherds. Just like Rebecca watering the servants' ten camels was a large task for Rebecca. This was a large task for Jacob, but he did it all by himself. So what he's showing here is that he's a good shepherd. He has a strong work ethic, and it's foreshadowing what is going to happen with Jacob, because as I mentioned, Laban clearly does not have a very efficient livestock operation going on here. Laban might need a good shepherd. Laban might need somebody who can do a good job and and manage his flocks well. So this shows that God is taking care of him, just like God had promised when he met him at Bethel and told him that he was going to take care of him and be with him. It shows that God is taking care of him already. Verse 11 says, Jacob kissed Rachel. So Jacob kissed Rachel and he wept aloud. Other translations say here that he lifted up his voice, which is an interesting contrast compared to Abraham's servant who bowed low in worship. Genesis 24, 26 says the man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord. After he recognized that Rebekah was the one that God had sent him and that God had answered his prayer, he bowed his head and worshiped, whereas Jacob lifted up his voice. But it does depend on what translation you're reading. So Laban heard about Jacob, and so he ran out to meet Jacob. And Jacob told Laban what happened, and Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. So Jacob stayed with Laban for a month, and then in verse 15, Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? So there's two interpretations here, but one I think is more likely than the other. So the first one, the interpretation that I read as I was studying for this chapter is that Laban was telling Jacob that if he wanted to stay, he needed to work because he had been there a month. Laban is saying, hey, look, you're here. I love having you, but you can't just mooch off my stuff forever. If you want to stay, you got to work. You got to pull your weight around here. And the implication being that Jacob wasn't used to hard work because his family was rich. And so he had servants that did that for him at home. But I don't think that interpretation is all that likely because of the context of the chapter. There's no indication that Jacob was lazy or that he wasn't used to hard work. In fact, we already knew that he was a shepherd because he kept goats back home with his father. And he knew what to do with the flocks when he arrived in Haran. So he's clearly no slouch when it comes to shepherding. So I don't think that's a very likely interpretation. The other interpretation here is that Laban recognized how essential Jacob was, and he made an offer to keep him. Now, in those days, sons were paid through their inheritance. They weren't paid wages. So a son would, in this example, Laban is a shepherd, and so he had sons that would work for Laban, for their father, not for wages, but for their inheritance. So they were incentivized to do a good job because the The better job they did, the more work they did, the harder they worked, the greater their inheritance would eventually be. So they were working for long-term gain. It was servants that were paid wages. So here, in this case, Jacob was not Laban's son, so he didn't have an inheritance that he was working for. So there's really no incentive for him to stay, but Laban clearly wants him to stay and continue running his livestock operation. So he's offering to pay Jacob a wage to keep him basically as a servant. But that also meant this was a good deal also for Jacob because Jacob wanted to marry his daughter, Rachel. And so Jacob, by by working for wages, would be able to pay a dowry now to marry Laban's daughter because Jacob wouldn't be able to marry Rachel unless he had a dowry, unless he had a means to show that he could provide for Laban's daughter upon becoming married. So Laban 
asks Jacob, what shall your wages be? And Laban, we're told that Laban had two daughters. The older was Leah and the younger was Rachel. And in verse 17, it says that Leah's eyes were weak. But clearly, Jacob, in verse 18, loved Rachel. And he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. So this is basically a dowry. Because he didn't have any money, he said, here's my wages. I'll serve you seven years. You give me your daughter as my wages for my work. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man which is very interesting, the way he said this. That's kind of a verbal sleight of hand because he didn't specifically promise to give Rachel to Jacob at the end of the seven years. And if you've read this story, you know what's going to happen. Laban had other ideas in mind. Laban is taking this opportunity to take advantage of Jacob. All he said to him was, it's better that I give her to you. But he didn't actually say, Yes, I agree. I will give her to you. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. So seven years seemed like no time at all. He was working, waiting for the day when he could take her as his wife, when he could take Rachel as his wife. So verse 21, Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife that I may go into her for my time is completed. So he finished the seven years working for Rachel and now he's asking for his wife. So Laban, verse 22, gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. So this was the celebration feast for the wedding. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. And in verse 25, and in the morning, behold, it was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? So the deceiver had now been deceived by Laban. Jacob the deceiver had now been deceived. And it's funny because he asked this as if he'd never deceived anyone ever in his life. So Laban said, it is not done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. There's no way for us to know if he's lying or not. We have no idea if that was actually true. But it's an interesting parallel between Jacob and Esau and Rachel and Leah. Because Esau's birthright was meant for the firstborn. But the younger son, Jacob, took it. And now Jacob intended to marry the younger daughter, Rachel, but Laban deceived him and gave him the firstborn, Leah. So this is an indication here because of these parallels and these inversions between the firstborn and the younger, Esau being the firstborn, Jacob being the younger, now Jacob wanting to marry the younger and receiving the firstborn instead. These parallels here are telling us that this is direct consequences for Jacob's sin and for Jacob's deception. It's showing us that God did not approve of what he did. Again, God is with him. God is providing for him. God is taking care of him. But part of taking care of him and part of leading him is to allow him to experience the consequences for his actions. So in verse 27, Laban tells Jacob, complete the week of this one, meaning marriage ceremonies lasted a week in those days and in that culture. So Laban wanted Jacob to finish the marriage ceremony for Leah. He's saying, look, we don't do this in our country. We don't give the younger in marriage before the older. So I gave you the older. I gave you Leah to marry her. Finish her marriage ceremony. Don't embarrass her. Take her as your wife. Finish the marriage ceremony. And he says, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. So he's saying, if you just finish the marriage ceremony and take Leah as your wife, I'll give you Rachel. 
I'll also give you Rachel right away. You can have Rachel as, as a wife as well, as long as you work for me for another seven years. So Laban is manipulating Jacob into getting another seven years of work out of him. Laban is benefiting from this greatly. He's marrying his daughters off. He's getting essentially free labor for 14 years. He's coming out on top here. He's doing pretty well for himself. So in verse 28, Jacob did so and completed her week. So he finished the marriage ceremony for Leah. He really had no argument against Laban's reasoning. Again, we don't know if Laban was telling the truth or not, but based on Jacob's response, it's likely that Laban probably was telling the truth. And so Jacob simply complied with Laban's request. He finished Leah's marriage celebration, and then Laban gave him Rachel to be his wife. So now, in verse 31 through the rest of the chapter, we turn the focus of the story to the rivalry between Rachel and Leah. And this is going to go on through the next chapter. In verse 31, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated because Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. Now, this word hated in the Bible, it does not necessarily mean that Jacob despised Leah. It just means that he loved her less than Rachel. It doesn't mean that Jacob didn't like her. It doesn't mean that Jacob hated being around her. He clearly didn't because Jacob has children with her. It just means that he loved her less than Rachel. Just like Jacob was loved less than Esau by Isaac. And Jacob wasn't despised by Isaac, but he was loved less. Esau was his favorite. Rachel was Jacob's favorite. But it says that Rachel was barren, just like Sarah and Rebekah were before her. So this is an indication that the chosen seed would come through Rachel. And the storyline of Genesis seems to confirm this because the barren woman usually was, up to this point, was the one who would bear the chosen seed. But, plot twist, it turns out to be Leah, who is the mother of Judah, who would turn out to be the chosen seed. So now we see how God is working against Jacob's plans. Jacob wanted to marry Rachel, but Laban tricked him. Now Jacob has Rachel, but she's barren. But Leah is able to have children. And Leah is going to be the one who would bear the chosen seed, her son Judah. So God here is trying to get Jacob to rely on him, not on his own plans. So Leah conceived in verse 32 and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben which means see a son. Now, this is interesting that she called his name Reuben because Jacob was not involved in naming the son. Usually in those days, the fathers would name the children, but here he does not seem to have any interest in Leah's children. So she calls him Reuben in verse 32 because she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction. Just like the Lord saw Hagar, Leah is recognizing that the Lord sees her. So we're noticing a pattern here, that God sees those who are not favored by men. God sees those who are overlooked. God sees you. He sees what you're going through. This should bring comfort. Then in verse 33, she conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am hated. So first God saw Leah, now he heard Leah. So Leah is giving credit to God for these children. She is recognizing God's hand in her life, even though she's from a family of pagans. And we didn't really talk about this, but Laban was not a worshiper of the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He has several pagan idols and practices divination through idol worship, as we're going to find out in later chapters. So Leah is putting Jacob to shame. Because Jacob was the one who inherited God's promise. Jacob is the one who should be recognizing God's hand in his life. But he, he doesn't. Either he's completely ignorant to it, to God, or he simply doesn't care. But Leah is putting him to shame because Leah has never received God's promise. She simply is able to partake in it through marriage to Jacob, and she is fully crediting God for taking care of her. This is very, very commendable on her part. So she calls his name Simeon, which is similar to the word heard, and the fact that God heard her implies that Leah had been actually crying out to the Lord. So not only was Leah giving credit to the Lord, but 
she had been crying out to God in the first place. Her prayers weren't to her father's idols. Her prayers weren't to some pagan gods. Her prayers were to Jacob's God. And Jacob's God heard her. Then in verse 34, she conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Levi, which is similar to the word attached, because she said, now my husband will be attached to me because I've borne him three sons. So the word Levi is similar to the word attached in Hebrew. This is interesting because the tribe of Levi would eventually become priests and they would essentially attach or join Israel to God through their priestly ministry. That was the purpose. They were to be a tribe that would essentially be intercessors. They would go between God and men. They would be that attach point between God and men. And in verse 35, she conceived again and bore a son, said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah, which is similar to the Hebrew word for praise. So now Leah had stopped complaining about Jacob when she bore her previous three sons. Even though she was giving glory to God, she was still upset and hurt by the way Jacob had treated her. And she named them out of hope that her husband would love her and recognize her and be attached to her. But this time she had stopped complaining about Jacob. Now she was simply giving thanks to God and praising God. If you notice, she had three sons, which three often is the number of testing. So she was being tested, but she was also testing Jacob. So God was testing her to see with these first three sons what her response to him would be. Because as we noticed, Leah is giving credit to God for taking care of her. So God was testing Leah to find out what her response would be. And she was also testing Jacob to see if he would love her during those first three sons. And so with the fourth child, now Leah recognizes that God is her true husband. She comes through this test praising God because God had seen her, God had heard her, and she had nothing but praise for God. And she recognized that her husband did not pay attention to her. Her husband did not seem to care, but there was one true husband that she had that cared, and that was God. So at the end of verse 35, it says, then she ceased bearing. see how this chapter points to Jesus. So first, if you noticed earlier in the chapter, there was a stone that needed to be rolled away that would provide access to water for the sheep. Well, if you've been paying attention, you've noticed that wells are a symbol of life or living water. And later, much later, many thousands of years later, a stone would be rolled away to provide access to living water for his sheep. Jesus would be buried in a tomb three days after his death. The stone that covered the entrance to his tomb would be rolled away, and now there would be access to Jesus, the living water, for all those who would come to him who are thirsty. It's just a small detail in this story, but it points to Jesus as the living water. Even these small details, we should pay attention to them, because we can find Jesus in even the smallest of details. In the Bible. The second way that I have here is Leah had two sons. Actually, she had four in this chapter, but there's two sons that are important as it relates to Jesus because she has a son, Levi, who would become the priestly line, and she had a son, Judah, who would become the kingly line, and Jesus was descended from Judah. Obviously, Judah then becomes the promised seed, the one who would bring about the messianic line, the messianic seed or offspring. All the kings of Israel would be descended from Judah, or I should say all the kings from the southern kingdom of Judah. Obviously, when the northern kings split, many of those kings were not from the tribe of Judah. But Jesus would be descended from the tribe of Judah. And Jesus is our priest and our king. Just like I mentioned in the episode about Melchizedek, 
how he points to Jesus because he is both a priest and king. We have in this chapter both the priestly line and the kingly line or the royal line being born here. So before we get to our question for reflection, I just want to remind you, if you are enjoying what you hear and you want to hear more, go to Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash beyondthebasics683, and you can subscribe there for only $4 a month. You can get access to the full uncut episode that I release each week at the same time as I release this episode for free that you're listening to right now. So you're going to get anywhere from... 10 to 20 minutes, sometimes 30 minutes of additional audio on those Patreon episodes that I cut out of the free episode. You're going to get a lot of extra content. You're also going to get access to all previous Patreon episodes. So, for example, if you go and subscribe today, you'll get access to this episode, Genesis 29, but you also get access to the uncut episode for Genesis 28 and 27 and so on and so on. All those archived episodes are included as well. So let's get to our question for reflection for this week. As I ask this question, make sure you think about it, meditate on it this week as you're going through your work week or whatever you have going on this week. Think about this. Think about This question, why does God allow us to experience the consequences of our actions? What would happen if you were to always shield us from those consequences that we experience? What would happen if you were to be shielded from the consequences of your actions? Think about why God allows you to experience those consequences. What purpose does that have in your life? What purpose could God be moving towards in your life? So think about that, meditate on it, and let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word and for everything that you have to say to us through your scriptures. Pray that you would reveal to us more about how good of a father you are. Teach us, Lord, as we go through life and as we struggle to obey, as we struggle to hear your word and do what it says. Lord, I pray that you would Teach us to be grateful and that you are not going to allow us to simply get away with sin and get away with disobedience. We thank you for your discipline. Thank you for your hand in our lives. Pray that you would reveal to us the things that you are doing that are making us more mature, that are making us mature believers and followers of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for listening to this episode. As always, click like, click subscribe, rate the show. Always helps increase the reach of this show. My first goal is to always make sure that people have access to an in-depth Bible study that's going to lead them to Jesus. Whether people know Jesus or not, I want them to be led to Jesus. So that's my main, most important goal with this Bible study. So If you can click that like button, more people are going to be able to find the show and listen. So just that simple action can help out more than you might think. Also, I always want to hear your feedback. So you can leave a comment on social media, Facebook, Instagram. You can leave a comment on the website, beyondthebasics.blog. Send an email, beyondthebasics at beyondthebasics.blog. I always love hearing from you. Always love hearing your feedback. Have a great week and talk to you next episode.